welcome everybody to uh, this webinar. Uh, my name is Paul Hugh Jones, and with my Atlas my hat on, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, Atlas my webinar uh, from Beeson, and the topic is client centricity: how to execute and measure ROI. And uh, Atmo is uh, keen to bring thought leadership to its members. And this is uh, one topic which we know is, is uh, close to uh, members' hearts and, and of interest. Uh, switching from my Atlas my hat to my Beaton hat, uh, I'm a director of Beaton and look forward to running through this presentation with you today. Um, let's also introduce my colleague George. Thank you, Paul. And uh, welcome to from me, George Beaton one of the co-founders of Beaton and one of the five partners around Australia in Beaton. Uh, we've got a record crowd today that's building up rapidly from the monitor that we can see. And uh, this is probably related to the fact that client centricity is one of the hottest, hottest topics we hear around firms. So we're delighted to share our insights, which are research-based as always with you. Um, uh, share what we hear is hearing in the market and uh, most importantly, focus on what your firms can do to become more client-centric. Uh, today is running as a webinar. So on the screen, uh, you can see the title page and you can uh, see the, uh, the uh, number uh, flashing at the bottom of the screen. If you wish to ask a question at any time, please text this number, which is Australia 418 325-351, plus 61 for those outside of Australia who are listening in today. And uh, those texts will go through to the screen. And from time to time, we will pick up on all the questions. If there are more questions than we can cope with, we do hope you will understand that. Um, and we will ha have formal pauses in the, uh, in the webinar for, for your question time, reflection, and discussion. So please be ready with your with your uh, smartphones ready to go. Uh, this is going to be led in two parts, and the first is with you, Paul. Over to you. Thanks, George. So client centricity is uh, a hot topic. Every firm is talking about client centricity as a strategic priority. We talk about client focus now, client centricity. Uh, but there's very variable interpretations and some, sometimes confusion as to what client-tricity actually means, um, and what clients actually value, and, and in that, what are the objective and actionable ways of measuring client-centricity? So how would you know what to action, how would you know what to measure? Um, and in order to be able to do that, how to execute for improving client-centricity? And then whether you're actually making any progress, how would you know if you're uh, making progress, how could you measure that? And as we go around and present our beaten benchmarks to firms which we're known for, um, you see a lot of frustration amongst leaders and BD teams. Uh, and then the question is, you know, we're putting, firms putting a lot of effort uh, and investment into client programs, client service initiatives, but, but how do you actually know that these programs which are designed around client centricity, how do you know if uh, you're actually moving the dial. How do you follow through uh, on these programs, which might be focused on client service and uh, improving reliability? How do you know you're actually moving the dial on these things, um, rather than having to wait another year for a new set of data? Um, and, and so that's, for, for us, as, as a background, um, uh, the genesis of this presentation and, uh, and the new product that we're, uh, we're bringing to the market. So what we're going to cover today is, first of all, uh, changing client buyer behavior. What, what this changing client buyer behavior, which we'll go through, means to firms. Uh, then we'll look at client centricity and, and a number of factors that we see in, included in that. And, and you can form a judgment as to how client-centric your firm is. Uh, after that, we're going to pause for, for questions. So if you want to text your questions through, we'll uh, collect them. And then we'll uh, bring a few of them forward to, uh, to answer. And then we'll cover the business case for maximizing client centricity and uh, succeeding on your client centric journey.
So th this is a time series chart using beaten benchmarks data. We, we've got data going back 14 years um, in legal and almost as many in the other professions. This is for accounting in Australia. And uh, the, the three lines, the, the, the blue line is overall client service, the, the pink line is perceived value, and the gray line is perception of, of fees. Uh, and, and we see the same trend across the professions, law, uh, accounting, engineering, management consulting. And, and, and what we see is that client perception of perceived value uh, and client service has been rising steadily over the past six years. And we expect to see this continuing uh, when we see the new results in 2017, the Beaton Benchmark Survey currently in field. Paul, it, I think it's fair to say whilst we haven't been measuring all professions uh, as systematically in New Zealand as we have in Australia for the past several years, we, we have indications that uh, the same trend is occurring in New Zealand. So this is not an Australian phenomenon. We, we have a strong view. This is a, a, a global phenomenon uh, amongst clients. Um, so certainly the, the flat fee one is. Good, good point, George. Thank you. Um, so we've got increasing client service, increasing perceived value, uh, but, uh, but flat fees. So what does this mean? Well, first of all, we, we all know it's a buyer's market pricing powers in the, in the client's hands. But, but the other way of looking at this is that expect, client expectations for higher value and better service increase every year. Um, so that actually is a real opportunity for the firms that can seize on value and client service uh, and differentiate in the experience they bring to clients. So that's the opportunity side. The other way of looking at this is that if you are staying still in the value and the service you're offering, you're actually going backwards relative to your competitors and to what the rest of the market's doing. So if you're, if you're staying still um, and we know those uh, fees are flat, you could get caught in the scissor effect uh, and be left behind potentially caught between the blades of the scissors. So, the flip side of that again is that we see very clearly that um, firms who are successful in delivering superior value and superior service are able to charge a premium. Um, so this is the context, if you like, uh, for client centricity. So all this points towards an intensification of the buyer's market. So when we look at the major trends uh, that are happening in the market, we see a fragmented market with clients having greater choice. We see uh, overcapacity and basically too many firms competing on price and clients enjoying a price-based picnic. Uh, we see falling switching costs and it's no longer the norm certainly to have client loyalty one a client buying one firm mostly, but we see far more increasing client sophistication, uh, clients who can segment their work and think about what they want to leave in-house, what they want to brief externally, and of those they want to brief externally, uh, thinking about the suitable firm for each work type, indeed the, the suitable partners, the best partners at different firms for each work type. Got lower entry barriers, uh, constant new entrants, whether it's boutiques or tech enabled, um, maturing life cycles and products coming commoditized, which means you've either got to innovate, reduce cost or exit, uh, and all of this leading to hyper competition. Uh, and you know, for the firms, these many firms who find themselves snookered, uh, declining profitability um, of the incumbent. And I think it's fair to say, Paul, that these six trends um, really reflect structural change. Uh, they're not secular in the sense of cyclical and a long economic cycle. It's not that we're in a very protracted recession after the GFC of now you know, eight years ago, eight, nine years ago. Uh, and structural change isn't undone in any industry. These are permanent trends. 
And the only question firms face is, uh, do we want to do something about how we respond to them or slowly go out with the tide, uh, which is what happens in many hyper-competitive industries. Firms either wake up too late and can't make the changes uh, or decide it's too hard and don't make the changes. Um, so part of our mission in this, uh, in this webinar and generally uh, is to bring these firms, uh, bring these trends to firms' attention, not in a doomsday selling kind of way, uh, but in a reality. Uh, and as Paul is about to show us, uh, there's a lot that can be done to uh, swim against this tide, powerful as it is. That's right. Thank you, George. Um, and and the for all of those that come from a marketing or, or BD or, or client-focused background, um, whatever the competitive environment, the one and and the dynamics of the market, uh, one's ability to do, really deliver um, for clients and to be client-focused and client-centric uh, is a way of being successful, uh, maximizing the opportunity in the current situation, and and certainly differentiating is the way to go in the in the future. So, what we're actually saying is counterintuitively these trends, uh, this, this is your biggest opportunity. Um, because clients are seeking and getting better value and, and service, and therefore the, the opportunity is to differentiate on the value you're providing and the service you're actually providing. So when we, we look at value, and a lot of our beaten uh, consulting is based on trying to unpack value, uh, for clients, what does value mean? Uh, that's a subject for another time, but it doesn't necessarily mean lower price. Uh, it, it, absolutely not, it, but it would be in terms of delivering what's value to clients. At the transactional level, um, clients have four choices once they've experienced working with you. Uh, either exit, which means sack you, uh, and quite possibly tell a lot of other people about the negative experience or neglect you, don't tell you and start using other firms, uh, or voice where they complain constructively to you, uh, or ideally loyalty where they remain uh, with you, repeat by and advocate, advocate for you. So uh, th this is actually, if you like, the opportunity for client centricity, minimizing A and B and encouraging C and D. And this, this construct of exit, voice and loyalty is a uh, uh, widely known and admired, uh, comes from a widely known and admired book by Albert O. Hirschman, who is Professor of Social Sciences at Princeton. Um, and in fact, this is the framework that we use at uh, Beaton Benchmark um, and also our new product, Beaton Debrief, as the key measurement framework. So minimize A and B, encourage C and D, client centricity, uh, which firm doesn't have that as a goal, uh, easily said, hard to do. And, and the key questions here are, firstly, how do you differentiate your client experience in ways that clients most value? And here's the kicker, consistently, which is the holy grail for every professional service firm. And then how do you actually generate client feedback and actions on that feedback in real time, which really means the right time to be able to recover unhappy clients and encourage happy clients to repeat by an advocate and advocate for you. And, and that really um, is, is, is the key point. I, I find this really quite a sobering framework to look at. Um, if you're a firm with only 10 clients, then it wouldn't be all that hard to know uh, which are loyal because most people in the firm know those clients and know what their intentions are. You'd also be small enough to know which firms, uh, which parts of the firm have had complaints, the voice option with clients. And if you really were across your relationships with, with those 10 clients of yours, you, you would be picking up who is neglecting uh, and, and you'd pretty well know who had sacked you. So if you're a 10 client firm, which is a, a pretty small firm these days, uh, this is not hard. But when you go to 100 clients and 1,000 clients, uh, and even more, you have to have a systematic approach to be client-centric. There is no way individually, anecdotally, 
uh, exchanging information within the firm uh, amongst yourselves, those who have touch, touch points with clients, you can possibly have a, a fully strategic, systematic approach to minimizing the probability of exit and neglect and encouraging and maximizing the probability of, of voice and loyalty. So client centricity for the majority of, of, of firms in the APSMA membership is very much asking the question, how do we know which each of these behaviors applies to each of our clients? That, that is the really serious question uh, on the client-centric journey. Thanks, George. So um, client centricity, uh, key take out, and here's an obvious statement, uh, another way of phrasing client centricity is putting the client at the center of everything you do. Uh, what this means in practice, well, well the starting point has to be to understand the drivers of value and satisfaction at each stage of the buyer life cycle. And in the delivery phase, reliability, um, understanding business and industry, cost consciousness. In your profession, in the industry you're operating in, the clients you're working with, what are the key drivers? It could be one of those, those attributes. Um, and how can you differentiate on those? But what you need to know what they are to start with. Once you know what the key drivers are, then you need to set inspiring KPIs for achieving uh, your client experience targets. And then you need to deliver an excellent experience on those key drivers consistently. So again, what we see around the traps is, is many firms running client service initiatives a lot of effort and investment going into them, um, and some very well-designed programs. But how do you know if you're actually succeeding or not? Uh, if you're an engineering firm focused on reliability, how do you know you're actually moving the dial on reliability? And, and feedback and measurement is obviously key here. And, and what you need to do is you need to have your finger on the pulse of any real issues in real time across the firm, so not for reporting purposes, but so you can action them with real-time conversations. So if, imagine right now in the next six weeks if you were able to look across all the engagements, jobs, matters that your firm is running and have a finger on the pulse to know exactly where the issues are, where the red flag issues are right now, and you could then uh, engage with those clients find out what the issues are, turn them around. And in, in essence, that's the design brief for our new product, Brief and Debrief. Uh, while measurement's crucial, the other piece is, in being client-centric, is really needing the whole of organization thinking and action. So your brand experience has to tie in with firm strategy with the firm structure, uh, with the people strategy and operations. Um, and put, put simply, if, if you're looking to drive this effectively, and this is the other phrase we hear often talked about, it's really about cultural change. Um, and so again, we, we, we see uh, part of the output of this is, is driving cultural change. How can you be the most reliable firm? How can you differentiate on reliability if internally you're not highly reliable to each other, as an example. So the, the other piece in this slide is, is in behavior is that leaders have to be role models. Um, and aligning the, the leadership uh, through role modeling and through the other part of strategy, operations, people, uh, is, is really where we see uh, successful execution. So. The, the other piece in this is, again, it's very well known, this famous message from the Service Profit Chain book, happy staff leads to happy clients in a virtuous circle. Uh, but underlining again that measurement is key. So that's a good place for us to, uh, to pause and uh, invite you to send through any questions that you have. Um, before we go on to the 
next few sections business case for clients interested in how to measure it. So, well, we've got our first question. Um, I think the question is asking on slide six. You you were referring when you when you were presenting and the uh, under under senior leaders, we've got driving culture change. What exactly do do do, do we mean by that, Paul? Well, it refers to the the point I was giving the example of reliability. Uh, one of the conversations we have with with firms and 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 actually people get very quickly is that if you if you are going to differentiate on reliability as a firm, then then internally you would have to be unbelievably reliable to each other. The expectation of reliability means doing what you say you're going to doing what you say you're going to do in the time frame you said you're going to do it. Uh, so how can you be reliable to a client in terms of delivery if you rely, as we often do, on other stakeholders in the business? So reliability from cultural change would go through from the recruitment policy to the KPIs people are measured on, um, to the values of the organization, uh, to the training programs, to the, to the client metrics. Um, and uh, people would need to live and breathe uh, these attributes internally as well as externally. That, that's what we would mean by uh, by culture, and the cultural change piece would come from those examples of instilling it through the organisation. And a lovely little story that illustrates what Paul is uh, talking about. There is the the inspiration behind the service profit chain book, uh, and this was a study in banks in Maryland, where the bank observed that some branches were far more profitable than others, and um, it was counterintuitive because the most profitable branches were in the most socioeconomically depressed parts of Baltimore. Uh, and they asked um, a, an independent uh, academic, in fact, to go and investigate this. And what he found was that in those branches where the tellers, in the days there were lots of tellers in branches, were happiest, the customers were happiest, uh, and the customers' buying behavior from the bank was highly suited to the bank's profitability. Um, and had nothing to do with the socioeconomics of, of, of the surrounding suburbs. Uh, and on further interrogation, why were some banks so happy at the teller level and others so unhappy? It boiled down to the role of the bank branch manager. And so managers who uh, walk the talk, inspire change, motivate their people and are responsive to their people, simply we're inviting their people to be so responsive to the customers and the customers rewarding them. So that's really what the service profit chain is about, as the name suggests. We've got another question here, which is how do you measure intangibles like reliability, particularly when you're talking about real-time um, understanding and response? So, George, how do we measure reliability? Uh, in our re measurement framework, in our, our research, we, we have 13 core attributes, one of which is reliability. And uh, we, we, over time, have done thousands of pieces of analysis of uh, respondents in our surveys who report the behaviors that constitute high scoring, nines and tens on reliability, or low scoring, six, five, four, three, two, one, on reliability. And by uh, analysis, con content analysis of those verbatims, we know pretty much the behaviors that constitute good and bad reliability. And uh, in the, in the um, follow-up to this uh, webinar, I can offer that we'll send you a link to a post we put up earlier this year doing a very detailed analysis and sharing with everybody uh, the behaviors that constitute these, as, as the questioner suggests, are somewhat amorphous or intangible attributes. Uh, we, we have identified the behaviors that so constitute. Very good. Well, we'd encourage you to send some more questions in um, for our next uh, pause for questions. But now I'm going to hand over to George for the second part of the presentation. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we're going to start with a, a concept that's becoming increasingly adopted uh, in professional services uh, of the net promoter score. And as the title in this slide suggests, it's the net promoter score at the relationship level, uh, which is at the level of the whole of firm uh, with its clients, uh, rather than uh, at a higher level, i.e. the marketplace, or at a more micro level, i.e. at 
project or matter level, which we'll come to in a moment. But fo focusing on our data again over the last six years in the four major professions that we measure in Australia, our biggest time series, you'll see that net promoter scores are climbing, a bit like perceived value and overall client experience that Paul shared at the beginning. But that law and accounting uh, are, climb are at a higher level and are climbing at a slightly greater incline and for the first time passed into positive territory in, uh, in 2016. Um, our survey completed um, at the beginning of this year with consulting engineering and management consulting um, all, both increasing but lagging somewhat behind. For those perhaps not entirely familiar with the, uh, the concept that Net Promoter Score, let me just explain that this is the famous uh, only question you need to ask or the ultimate question you need to ask or the one question you need to ask, uh, made popular by Bain. Um, would you recommend this firm in this case to a friend or a business associate on a scale from zero to 10, where nines and tens are called the promoters and six and lowers are called the detractors, sevens and eights, the passives or the neutrals. And the score is calculated by subtracting from the percentage of nine and 10 responses, the percentage of zero through six respondents. And that gives you the score, which tells us that for the first time, the two professions of law and accountancy have got a, high, a slightly greater proportion of uh, promoters than detractors, uh, but that, uh, management consulting and consulting engineering are still in negative territory. Now this is important because it's setting a scene for how you take action in response to these findings. So let me in the next slide uh, elaborate on, the, on this notion of uh, three levels of, uh, of, of net promoter score, three levels of measurement for that matter. Uh, the, the highest level at the top of this inverted triangle is the market that you serve and your brand's position, the position of your firm's brand in that market. And we typically get at these through brand health surveys of various kinds. And the Beaton Benchmarks Annual Survey is a very large quantitative survey of brand, brand position, and brand health. And uh, the level down is the level of the enterprise, namely the firms and the firm's clients reporting on them. So each firm's clients, defined as those users and buyers in the last 12 months reporting on their level of satisfaction with your client service value proposition, the, the other big part of the beaten benchmarks reporting. And at the lowest level, uh, as in most micro in this inverted pyramid, uh, either mid or and end of job or matter reviews, where the satisfaction of those members of the client organization with the team delivering the job to them uh, are captured and reported. Now what we observe um, is that um, many firms, and we would say too many firms, are in incurring the opportunity cost of not aligning the nature of the market intelligence they gather, the nature and kind of research that they do in the market uh, in a way that provides a common measurement framework and where brand can inform the client perception of performance and in turn uh, be reported and measured and understood at the level of individual jobs. So this ad hocracy and lack of common measurement frameworks is costly. There's opportunity cost in it, there's wasted effort, there's frustration for those who are charged with and responsible for gathering the data and then seeing it not being used as well as it can be. Uh, we not infrequently see this turning into a seven-day wonder. We got the latest report uh, and you know, seven days, uh, metaphorically speaking, nothing really happens. So nothing uh, is budgeted for next year's research budget and so on. So uh, the client-centric firm needs a systematic approach to this challenge. A better way to do it is to adopt a standard client-centric metric. And to date, no better has been found than the net promoter score. So any brand health research should incorporate uh, the competitive NPS, i.e. how your brand compares with 
in a comparative sense, your, 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 your competitor set. Uh, at the level of your client relationships, uh, your client satisfaction surveying should be incorporating the relationship NPS, as we saw in the first slide in this section. Uh, just how well are firms performing uh, one versus the other at, at the level of the whole of firm. And finally, you should incorporate into your feedback at individual job or matter to the project delivery transactional NPSs. Now, what, uh, what we have found in talking around the market in recent times is that um, there are many people who don't actually distinguish these three levels of NPS, understand what role each plays in measurement, and understand how the interpretation of the data is different. The question is the same. Would you recommend this firm, which you may or may not have used at the market level, would you recommend this firm to business associate where you have experience of them at the client service uh, last 12 months level, or would you recommend the people of this firm who've just delivered this project or job to you? So while the question is to tweak, the notion is the same of would you recommend with the same scoring system. And then this sets up a way of creating an aligned and truly uh, market-centric approach, client-centric approach, job-centric approach, getting feedback from your clients, which you, you then can uh, understand from this the power of it and explain why certainly in the corporate world, um, your clients, the corporates, large government departments and agencies uh, are using NPS more and more and more and why we are seeing it come so widely into the professions. And, and George, just coming so from a very practical point of view, uh, the concept of promoters and detractors are the concept of people that will, will positively or negatively advocate for your firm. So a promoter is actually someone who is happy to recommend your firm and given some encouragement uh, will do so. Um, so there's a real opportunity to, to, to leverage uh, well, to move people up to promoters and leverage them. Conversely, detractors, uh, you know, you say there's a much higher factor of likelihood of unhappy people talking about you um, to their friends and, and peers than there is for happy uh, people. So the detractors are a real drain on your business. Uh, detractors will be out there not only switching, but telling others. So just from a very pragmatic point of view, um, being able to identify and resolve issues with detractors uh, has, a, has an immediate benefit to the business. And in fact, those, as you can decrease detractors and increase promoters, you can see why this metric um, has that predictor of future business. I think most of us will remember, if nothing else from our undergraduate study days of marketing, the, the famous work done on bad word of mouth. Uh, where an unhappy customer goes out and tells ten, 10 other people this massive multiplier effect. And if you don't know that they're unhappy and you don't take urgent, immediate, effective remedial action, what you're setting up for is 10 prospects who are not going to walk through your door because they've heard bad things. Um, now, we don't know if that applies literally, the 1 to 10 ratio in the professional services environments that, that work's not been replicated in professional services to our knowledge. But you can imagine. Um, I'll just give you one little story, Paul, uh, audience. Uh, uh, our bid and benchmark survey is in the field at the moment and uh, we received in our office here um, an email from a respondent of, of, who was responding to the survey and we had received this person's name from one of the accounting firms on our list. And he wrote a very personal uh, an emotionally distressing uh, email about the treatment that he'd received at the hands of this firm that he regarded as quite unjust. In fact, he used the word immoral. Um, as an example, he quoted something about his deceased parents. It was a highly personal statement. And in, to end the email, which was simply a message to us, the surveyors, um, in, in a very constructive but hard-hitting tone, uh, that not only would he never be using this firm again, but he would at every opportunity be telling others about their behavior. Mm. Now, you know, we're bound by privacy or we can't tell this firm who, who this person is. But the fact that this had, be, had happened, that he had complained, he had voiced, and nothing had been done, 
no apology had been given, and he was left with a form to be signed by his mother, who was buried. Um, so it's a pretty dramatic example, but that happened yesterday. So you can imagine the damage being done to that brand in that particular community. Absolutely. So, um, yes, thank you, Paul, uh, to remind us of the importance of, of dealing with, with uh, unhappy customers. And we all make mistakes and all have unhappy customers. It's a question of do we fix them. Um, um, so let, let's move on uh, to the next slide. Uh, this is Fred Reichelt um, of Bain, uh, who made his name by writing that book originally, The Ultimate Question. And, uh, and, and has elaborated the whole NPS system, uh, including these three levels of competitive relationship and transaction NPS. Um, now, many of you who are students in this field will know that not everybody can replicate Bain's work. And there, for the last well, decade or so, there have been uh, people saying, well, exactly what Bain said isn't exactly true. And uh, we would certainly agree that and Bain now acknowledges, and he's written the ultimate question 2.0 to acknowledge this, that not, it, not one question is sufficient. Uh, it can't provide all the answers. And, and what we need is a framework of, that, of measurement that not only measures the outcome variable or the dependent variable of the net promoter score, would you recommend this firm, or this team, but what are the drivers of that sentiment uh, would you recommend? And so best practice is to incorporate an analysis of drivers as well so that you know behaviorally, as that earlier question questioner asked, well, how do we deal with this intangible? Uh, we need to know what behaviors we should do more of and we should eliminate and, uh, and certainly do less of. That will result in clients uh, holding attitudes towards us that will lift our net promoter score. So. Uh, the net promoter score is a, 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 a measurement tool, but it certainly can't in itself provide all the answers. So, so George, just um, again, the, the practical side of this is uh, if we're measuring net promoter score, what are the key drivers? And so, I mean, the interesting point for us when we look through our beaten data and look at relationships what drives a relationship net promoter score, what, what drives transactional net promoter score, is you can clearly identify, we can clearly identify what the key drivers are. And the disproportionately, um, again, coming back to reliability and engineering would be an, an obvious one. But also, one we mentioned, whether it's cost consciousness or ease of doing business, understanding business and industry. But for each profession, um, and in fact, it varies by industry within profession, it's critical to know what you need to dial up to influence net promoter score. It's not enough to say, how do we lift net promoter score? It's critical to know those key drivers, the key attributes, and then you can focus your effort on those attributes. You can't focus your effort on recommendation. You've got to focus your effort on on those key drivers. So, at that point, one question is not enough. Um, the context, the key drivers, the KPIs, the actions, the measurements, um, that, that, that's most likely to lead to success. And that, Paul, sounds like quite a large task, doesn't it, in a firm? You know, we, we have to teach old dogs new tricks. We have to invest. Uh, we have to get leaders to walk the talk. So what's the evidence that this pays? Uh, and that's a good segue into the next uh, Next chart on, on slide 11. What's the business case for increasing client centricity? Uh, it's got to be more than good feelings. So when you look at the research which we're summarizing here, um, there is very consistent evidence. It varies as to the extent and the industry and the nature of the interventions that the company and the industries uh, engage in. But there's very good evidence that NPS explains somewhere between 20 and 60% of variation in organic growth rates. And uh, that's not actually growing up, it's also growing down, increasing and decreasing growth rates of, a, of an organization. So a very big portion of this outcome called organic growth, in other words, from your current customers to your current products and products you may introduce, is coming from NPS. NPS is a predictor, it's a lead indicator. We also know that net promoter leaders can, uh, those scoring high 
in the Net Promoter League tables, uh, outgrow their competitors, that's the average, by a factor of two or more, including in compound average growth rates, CARG. So there's a very big prize here. And um, for those in BD and marketing who want to get the attention of those who hold the purse strings in firms, uh, being familiar with this and being able to explain the rationale for it, it's not just an empirical finding, it actually explains these case studies, uh, why this is so. And let's explore one of them. Um, th this is, a, again, a published study. Uh, this is a schema. In other words, the proportions I'm about to show you are not literal, so don't take them as literal, that you get this amount of increased profit each year for four years. Uh, it's illustrative. Uh, but I'm very pleased to say that a couple of years ago, we were able to replicate this finding in advertising agencies in Australia. Now, these are B2B businesses like any engineering, accounting, law, or management consulting firm. Classic B2B service industry that is super, super competitive uh, like those in the audience today. And this is what uh, uh, this particular research showed, that a number of years after acquisition of a major client, they become more profitable to the firm. So uh, th this is the P&L, the bottom line in five colors, if you like. So the first type of profit called base profit here uh, is simply the profit from the job you do, making sure that the income on the job exceeds the fully absorbed costs on the job. So it's profitable. Over time, as you earn the trust of the client, and the client begins to learn in purple here what you can do, you not only get more of that kind of work, but you get a better mix. In other words, the client gives you higher quality work that usually should be attracting because of its complexity, um, uh, give you a, a better margin. And over time, added to that, you should be learning about your client learning how they do business, how you lock into their systems and processes so that you can be more efficient and not necessarily pass all of those efficiencies through to the client. In other words, the clients of long standing, um, the providers to them have reduced operating costs on those clients, particularly if you've got stable teams serving them. And then the green profit comes from the peace of mind that a client gets. Uh, we know you're looking after it. We know you're working on Sunday while I'm playing golf. Uh, we know that you've got to team up all night on this problem while I'm sleeping comfortably, uh, or whatever the peace of mind factor is for a client, depending on the nature of the work you do for them. So um, not all clients display this, of course, but the studies show that on average, the longer you hold a good major client, the more profitable they should become if you are doing the right things uh, in a, the way you structure your services to them. And then the final cherry on the top, if you like, uh, cream on the coffee uh, is the profit from referrals from those clients because a referral from a really happy client from whom you are already extracting these additional components of profit will come through your front door with an expectation of what they're going to get because they've been told by the referrer and what they're going to pay. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really big prize to understand to be able to communicate inside your firms. Now outcomes like these uh, require more than simply measuring NPS. Um, and to show you in a case study way um, how some have gone about this, uh, in the next slide on 13, we'll share the Maersk uh, shipping container company uh, case study, which has been published. Not a lot of this in the public domain, but Beyond Philosophy has published this case study of Maersk. Uh, so these are these very big container ships. Maersk is the world's largest container shipping company. And when you look at that industry, uh, it has uh, some, admittedly more severe in, in, in aspects of it, uh, hallmarks of the industries in which the firms uh, who are members of AFSMA are operating. It's an industry plagued by overcapacity. Uh, it's an industry affected by price wars because of capacity excesses, um, and where, where um, sea traffic uh, is, is, is relatively stagnant. It's not growing. Um, Maersk, uh, in the way it's described in the case study, decided to do something about their position and their profitability. Uh, they adopted NPS as a key metric uh, and put in place a major culture change program around NPS, a, a comprehensive approach, top down from the board through the senior executive out into the many um, offices around the world of Maersk. And the uh, a key part of this is what 
uh, is known as a day in the life of the customer experience. Hundreds of their managers, um, in a structured way, were required to spend a day literally walking in the shoes of a customer to understand what it's like when a phone call isn't returned, when a container has gone missing, and you get an email saying it fell off the ship and we don't know where it is, whatever happens in the shipping industry. Um, and as a result of this approach and the immersion of their line managers in the customer experience, knowing that they were accumulating measurement from their, from their customer base, uh, they adopted this uh, customer experience statement. Very simple, very easy to understand. And you know, to an outsider, it might appear quite trite. But to those who'd walked in the shoes in the day of the life of the customer, it had real meaning because it was crafted by those people. We want to be trusted by our customers. We want them to feel cared for. And they want them to feel pleased that they're doing business with Maersk. The highly emotive statements that underpin buyer behavior, even in a highly commoditized industry like container shipping. And in 30 months, uh, Maersk lifted its NPS uh, and this was relationship NPS, uh, the middle NPS, the relationship between the customer organization and Maersk as an organization. It lifted from minus 10 to plus 30. That's a 40 point turnaround. And here, here is the punchline. Each four point lift, that's 10 of them from minus 10 to plus 30, 10 times four, 40 point lift results in a, for Maersk in a 1% increase in cargo volume. Uh, in this game, you can't play price premium to any real extent. You have to play the volume game and make sure your ships go out fully loaded and come back fully loaded. And when you're playing with a 10% with a, uh, increase in volume, suddenly you've got massive competitive advantage. Um, you're able to route your ships more effectively, uh, get them into port at the right time, get them out of port at the right time, because you've got volume that the customer, your competitors don't. So what this most case study shows in, in real life is a very powerful uh, example of how even a commodity like containers can be differentiated. As the late Peter Drucker want, was wont to say, there's nothing that can't be differentiated. Uh, it's only our imagination that prevents it. So um, it's a very good, good example of, of what can be done by both culture change informed by a powerful metric like NPS. So let's move on uh, to our last points before we go to a final question time. Um, what's best practice in, in measuring client centricity? So the focus here, uh, people, is on, on measurement. As I hope we've made the point between Paul and myself, there is more to becoming client-centric and increasing your client centricity than measurement. But without measurement, uh, many of the initiatives that we take um, are a bit like shots in the dark. So that's why we as researchers like to have measurement at the heart of client centricity. So the first thing is, what are you measuring and why? Um, uh, are, are you clear about what the objectives are of the measurement and what, when you've got the data, um, you will be doing with it. So that's the what and the why question. Measure in a way that's valid, in other words, actually represents how the clients feel, think, and act, and reliable. In other words, if you repeated the study, you get amongst the same type of clients, similar sample of clients, you get a similar result. So test, retest reliability uh, is high enough to rely on it. Uh, you need to think of at least measuring at firm, the relationship, and job, the transaction levels. Uh, because firm measurements you're only going to do infrequently. We only do it once a year. It's a very large task. Whereas jobs happen every day in firms and you can accumulate jobs and you can respond as Paul was showing very, very dynamically and tactically to job feedback, matter feedback. You can do it at the middle of jobs, periodically in extended ones. You get, for example, engineering or a very large transaction in law or accounting or at the end uh, of jobs. Um, if you get eight out of 10 all the time, is that good, bad, or indifferent? Well, we don't know unless we've got competitive comparisons. We do need benchmarks. Because if your competitors are getting an average of 8.5 and you're getting uh, an average of eight, you're in fact not getting 80% term paper marks. You're behind the competition. 
So we do need to know our competitive position. And the KPIs we set as a result of measuring need to be smart. That is to say specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, particularly in the stretch targets they set, and time bounded. So we know objectively are we succeeding or not, and we can learn from that. The second aspect of, of, of client centricity measurement uh, goes to how we collect the data, how we know from our clients. And we need to collect in a way, as Paul was stressing earlier, that we can action the detractors, those giving us low scores, and the promoters, those giving us high scores, in real time so we can hold actionable, meaningful, close to the point of the event, uh, or the feelings uh, of the client's conversation. We need to minimize sponsor bias. In other words, clients need to feel that this is being independently gathered, otherwise they overrate. Uh, we see that's well established that sponsor bias is clients go soft when they get feedback, if they think it's directly to the person who's listening. Um, Paul and I heard a story the other day where a firm said, you know, all this feedback we get, we're getting eight, nine, and 10 all the time, so what's the point? We know we're bloody good because the client's telling us we're very good. We're saying, ha ha, sponsor bias at work. Um, one, you're probably happening to speak only to your very happy clients. Um, the system's being gamed in some way. And two, they're going to tell you good things um, um, to a greater extent than they're going to complain. Um, so we want to be very careful there and make it objective. We want it systematic so there's no cherry picking. Um, we want it in a way where the clients feel they are party to this feedback, willing to give it, give it fearlessly and frankly, and expect you to respond to it. Uh, if you're going to do it, particularly at the job level, um, with a good proportion of your matters or projects, it needs to be very cost effective. And above all else here, you need to make sure that the practitioners who are getting the feedback about themselves have bought into getting the feedback and their willingness to respond to it and not react defensively or in denial. And that then leads to, to the last of these three points, how, do, how you interpret it, how you make it accessible. Uh, practitioners are not market researchers. They're not data analysts. Even the most numeric, the engineers amongst them, will prefer visual data that's specifically granular about their job, their matter, themselves, and done in a way that is dynamic. In other words, their feedback is close to the event, end of the matter, end of the project. It's got to be interpreted in a way that can be tracked, again, visually. Are we getting better? Are we staying the same? Are we getting worse? What parts of the firm are we doing differently? It's got to be benchmark comparative. And to the extent possible, it needs to be linked to the financial outcomes so that you can show the ROI uh, in your execution of client feedback. Just a couple of observations to build on that, George. Um, we often talk to clients and uh, to our firm's clients and they say, but what about the face-to-face -face client feedback we do with our partners and BD teams? And just to be clear, that this is as well as. The, the, the client feedback that's done face-to-face -face, uh, with partners, lead practitioners, BD people is, is unbelievably valuable to, to build relationships, identify opportunities, resolve issues. It's, um, but the, 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 the idea and the difference of, of what we're proposing in, in this presentation uh, is really broad based uh, across the majority of matters and jobs that the firm is running in real time um, and, and absolutely avoiding cherry picking. So one of the biggest challenges for all client feedback programs is, is the cherry picking you only get to talk to the, the really happy clients or maybe the really unhappy clients but you miss the, the vast majority um, of clients and that's why we're focused on the engagement, the job. And in fact, it particularly focused on the middle of the, a, a mid-matter, mid-engagement uh, review. In fact, on a very large engagement, it may be at, at phase, different, the end of different phases in that project. Because you, if you're mid or project or at a phase in project, then your, your opportunity to, to turn issues around to, in a way that's valuable to the client uh, in real time on the job is, uh, is is that much higher. So, I'll back to you. That's there. a very good segue well, into the punchline on the slide, Paul. This is Edwards uh, Deeming, uh, the, the man who, whose voice wasn't being heard in the United States, so he went to Japan and he worked with the Japanese manufacturers in the 60s and 70s and the rise of Japanese quality 
Um, some of us may remember when a Japanese car uh, was uh, a bit of tin that fell apart after a year. We now see master, master, masterpieces of cars like the Lexus on the road competing with the finest German and others. And Edwards Deming is well understood to be responsible for that, uh, the Kanban and other systems. Uh, well, one of his many famous sayings was, without evidence, you're just another person with an opinion. Uh, and, and if anybody in the audience today needs a punchline for one of those partners who spoke to the most important client of the firm yesterday and says, this is how we should do it, uh, a sample of one like that is not evidence. It's just another person with an opinion uh, we'd put to you. So now it's time for, um, for our closing questions. Uh, if you haven't yet sent them through, there's still, uh, still a few minutes to send them through to the number on the screen. Uh, have we got a question? Ben? We've got a couple of good ones. Go for it. Uh, so the question is, what's your view on all clients giving 8 out of 10, which they consider high, where technically they're passive and therefore that promoter score is, is zero. So the, the, the point here is, um, the question here is, promoters score a nine or a 10, detractors six or below, you've got sevens and eights. Uh, and the, the, the question is, is this not a high score? Um, whereas they're tra treated as a passive, they get a zero from a net promoter score. So uh, a couple of observations. One is, um, we, we, have, we have clients that work with us on net promoter score and we get this same challenge Oh, legal are very critical. Um, we, we can't use net promoter score. We have to change the ratings because no one's going to rate a 9 and 10. Engineers, saying exactly the same things. Engineers are very harsh markers. Um, getting a 9 or 10 is, is hard. Uh, it, our data doesn't back that up. Uh, we get really, the good firms get really high scores on 9 and 10 promoters. Um, and there's no statistical difference on lawyers or engineers or uh, practitioners, uh, professional practitioners, and how they rate versus the, the public. Um, and the, the comment on passives, the starting point is that promoters and detractors because they're the, they're the priorities. But many firms actually uh, will talk to passives as well because you, if you can move passives to promoters, that that is clearly an opportunity. So it, it's you don't ignore passes, but it's just, again, like everything else, prioritization, where do you start? Mm. Just to reassure people and to add to what Paul said, we have got literally thousands and thousands of data points on relationship NPS. And for those who have seen your results or others' results, uh, they range fully from zero uh, to 10. Uh, and uh, it's a highly discriminating metric. Uh, good firms are really great. Uh, and firms at the opposite end of the spectrum of good are pretty ordinary. <laughs> Uh, with minus 50, minus 60 NPS at the relationship level. Uh, in our admittedly lesser experience with transactional NPS at the matter and job level, uh, we're seeing exactly what Paul said, uh, a, a distribution where the firms are, uh, uh, clients are equally happy to give nines and tens, sevens and eights and six and belows. So uh, we don't think there's any evidence on our scoring systems uh, to suggest that uh, clients are particularly hard markers or soft markers uh, and, or, or avoiding avoiding the issue. Okay, we've got uh, another question here. You, you've talked about the importance of competitive comparisons. How could we get this information? You want me to answer that, Paul? <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> happy, happy to do that. Uh, and this is, whilst we have talked about our benchmarking and our debriefing products, uh, it's not particularly hard sell, but we would be very well known in beaten benchmarks, as the title suggests, for benchmarking competitor sets. So, because uh, you know, for, for 35, 40 law firms in the country, uh, or 10 law firms in New Zealand, we know what each firm is performing at. Uh, in the beaten debrief product, uh, we have, with the clients that are already operating in the field with us, explicit contractual agreements to share that data with other firms as inter-firm comparisons proper privacy and confidentiality agreements in place, so who's the firm and who their clients, totally protected, uh, to provide just these comparative statements, inter-firm comparisons. So it's not available yet, but uh, give us a few months at the rate it's accumulating, we will have these available. So you know, how do you compare in your routine property transactions 
uh, with uh, the other firms, uh, we'll be able to show you that. How do you confirm in your complex tax advice? We'll be able to show you that. Right. Thanks. Well, we're out of time now, folks, and we do want to finish promptly. Uh, we would like to uh, thank APSMA uh, for hosting this webinar. And on your uh, screen now, if you would like a copy of this presentation, then please uh, email us at uh, that email address, fran.dfazio at beatonglobal.com. We'd be happy to send a copy of the presentation to you. Uh, but thank you, on behalf of George and myself, thank you very much for your time, and I hope you found this valuable. Thank you, all, Paul. Thank you.